Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. And I see we have all kinds of questions saved up here. Ah, uh, gosh, where to start? Okay, here's one from Architect. How do glaciers form? I don't think there's anything that difficult to understand about that. I think it's just uh, when water gets cold enough, it freezes into ice. Now, uh, it's a complicated story because ice comes in many different forms. So whenever you have a solid, uh, the different kinds of solids, there are crystalline solids and there are amorphous solids. So in a crystalline solid, all the atoms or molecules of the material are lined up in some regular array. So for example, in salt, table salt, sodium chloride, the, uh, uh, the, the sodiums and chlorines are arranged in this kind of cubic lattice, um, that a very, re very regular lattice like that. In diamond, there's another particular arrangement of the carbon atoms. In graphite, a different arrangement in which things that tend to be in sheets. In ice, there are different forms of ice that correspond to different possible arrangements of the of the water molecules. So, for example, in the most standard form of ice, um, there are hexagonal. It's a hexagonal array of positions of water molecules. So, for example, the reason that that snowflakes tend to have a basically hexagonal form is because under inside the little water molecules are arranged in this hexagonal grid. Now, in fact, when, when snowflakes are formed, it's kind of complicated. Sometimes snowflakes form as just a simple hexagonal plate, but usually they have arms hanging off them. And that, that happens because when, when the snowflake is growing, there are places on the snowflake where a new piece of ice is added. Every time water vapor condenses into ice, it releases a certain amount of heat. The, the reason for that is this. In the gas phase of water, where it's steam, um, the molecules are running around very fast. It makes a gas. In the solid, the molecules are just locked in place in their regular array. So in order for one to go from the steam where all the molecules are running around to the, to the solid where they're locked in place, you have to release some of that energy. So there's, there's the things are running around, they have high energy, each one has lots of kinetic energy, um, but then they, they're somehow they're, they're pulled together enough that they sort of lock in place into a crystal. And in order, to, when they lock in place into a crystal, that, that releases a certain amount of energy, which then becomes sort of heating up of that local region of the crystal. So what tends to happen is little collection of water molecules get together, they attach as a piece of ice somewhere on the growing crystal, they heat up that part of the crystal because they're losing all the kinetic energy that they used to have running around in a gas. And they're, they're, they're losing that and they're sort of diffusing it to the rest of the crystal. But then that means that there's a little local heating of the crystal at that place. And so that means that when a piece of ice has been added at a particular place, it's less likely that another piece of ice will be added quickly at that same place. It has to wait for the kind of heat to diffuse away. Otherwise it isn't cold enough for another piece of ice to be attached there. And so that phenomenon, it's kind of a, a local growth inhibition where things grew just now, they don't grow at the next moment. And that's what leads to this kind of dendritic structure, this tree-like structure, because what's happening is something grew out on this, on this piece of the tree, but it, it couldn't, it didn't grow in a place where it had already been accreted, but where there already had been ice added and so if you kind of work that out, you can work it out with one of these little cellular automata that I'm very keen on uh, as a very simple model where you just say you have a grid of a hexagonal grid of cells and you have black cells that represent solid and white cells that represent gas. And you add a black cell at every step where there's exactly one black cell adjacent to it on the step before. And if you do that, you'll find that you get these kind of tree-like structures that look like snowflakes. But if you look kind of inside the snowflake, even though the, the, the boundary has all this kind of tree-like structure, if you look inside the snowflake, all the water molecules in that idealized model, for example, are arranged in a hexagonal grid. And the same is true with, with sort of the most standard form of ice in, um, uh, uh, in when ice forms at standard 
pressure, for example, uh, it forms into that kind of hexagonal array. Now, if you're inside a glacier, for example, there's a big weight of ice on top of some particular part of the glacier. And so what you can find happens is that the when when the when things are freezing there, or perhaps it's it's rearranged as there's more pressure put on it, you'll you'll end up with something where the, the structure of the ice is different from the structure of the ice in sort of regular pressure uh, formation of ice. And there are many different phases. I think there are like 40 phases of ice that are known that correspond to different arrangements of the water molecules inside the piece of ice. And some of them will have different densities. So for example, ordinary ice of the kind I'm describing, this hexagonal kind of ice floats on water. I don't think these other forms of ice float on water. So that, and but you, you don't get to kind of see that normally because with ordinary sort of water, liquid water, you're, you're dealing with something which has, is at sort of standard pressure deep in the ocean, it'll be at higher pressure. But um, uh, so, so that's, uh, that's kind of, you know, the, these different forms of ice that exist in glaciers. And I think that's important to the structure of glaciers, that there can be different forms of, of ice there. Now, a question I don't know the answer to, uh, people say sometimes that uh, at least some earthquakes are due to changes in rock in the earth going from one phase, one arrangement of molecules to make the solid rock to another phase, and that that changes things like the volume of the rock and can lead to this sort of discontinuous change in, uh, in, in well, that, that it can change the, produce these fracture lines in the rock. And I do wonder whether similar kinds of things happen in glaciers, I don't know. Whether there are glacier quakes, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, generally what glaciers do in the terrain, they they make big grooves because they're kind of just, they're, you know, they're, they're heavy things and they're sort of pushing down, uh, uh, presumably to end in the ocean and so on. Um, and they, they, what tends to happen is that the when you have a landscape that has lots of valleys, lots of valleys get formed by these glaciers, I suppose what, what's happening is, okay, so, so first of all, rivers, for example, will gradually erode away the landscape. So if you have, um, uh, if you have something like um, uh, some fairly soft rock and you have water flowing through it, the river will gradually take little pieces of the rock and take them and, and sort of drag them downstream eventually to, the, to where the river ends in the ocean. And so it's taking little pieces of rock from, uh, from, from high up, perhaps in mountains, and it's eventually transporting them to the ocean. And wherever it takes out the rock, wherever the river was, it's taking out the rock. So the river will tend to grind itself deeper and deeper and deeper into the rock. The ultimate limiting cases, things like the Grand Canyon, for example, where the river has kind of gradually eaten out uh, pieces of the rock and taken away those little, little particles, little sand from the rock, taken that away, um, leaving, leaving just this kind of groove in, in the rock. And you know, one thing that happens with rivers, it's kind of complicated, is, is a river, it normally goes kind of straight, but as soon as it starts going off to one side, as soon as it has a bend, then when, when the river water uh, goes around the bend, it will tend to preferentially uh, uh, extract, break the rock down in places where, where the river is bending. And so what that means is you'll get more, more and more extreme meanders, more and more extreme versions of the river, uh, you know, going from side to side. Eventually, they'll get so extreme that the that the piece of river will break off, and you get these little islands in the middle of the river, and then there are multiple multiple pieces of of, of river that go in different on different sides. But in general, what happens is that this sort of river uh, that that's a it's a way that it sort of um, grinds out uh, pieces of rock, and I guess glaciers do sort of the same thing. Um, sometimes you, you see all kinds of strange geological phenomena. I mean, one that um, uh, is that a glacier, when it's kind of pushing its way down to the ocean, it can push all kinds of sort of crud in front of it, um, all kinds of, of other pieces of rock and mud and so on. And so you'll see these funny places like, like there's an island off the coast of Massachusetts called Nantucket, that has a very characteristic shape. It's a kind of a, a, um, a sort of bow-like shape. Um, and uh, you know, if you, if you go there, the island is very proud of its shape. And you know, every every uh, kind of utility cover 
um, has sort of an image of the of the shape of the island on it. But that shape comes because it was pushing when there was a glacier uh, from uh, the the that was pushing stuff down towards the ocean, and it pushed ahead of the glacier. It pushed all this stuff, and that 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 formed this kind of bow like like shape ahead of the um, uh, um, ahead of the glacier, and that's the stuff that got deposited there and turned into the island. So all sorts of phenomena like that happen. Um, I don't know. Uh, um, yeah, I think I think that's um, um, it's about all I all I have to say about formation of glaciers. I mean, I think um, uh, you know, in, in there, there tends to be in the history of the Earth, the Earth gets hotter, the Earth gets colder, and that happens for a variety of reasons, some of which are understood, some of which are not. There's a cycle, 23,000 years, I think, um, Milankovitch cycle, I believe, um, which is a cycle that has to do with the Earth's orbit around the sun, um, that uh, clearly the Earth is hotter if it's closer to the sun and colder if it's further from the sun. And so uh, anything that changes that is gonna change the temperature of the Earth. Also, the temperature of the Earth is changed by, the temperature of the surface of the Earth is changed by the Earth's atmosphere. But to say the first thing, clearly what, what heats the Earth is light from the sun, radiation from the sun, mostly at visible light. Um, and uh, the, well, actually a spectrum of, of light, but it's mostly concentrated in the visible part of the spectrum. So that if the, if the temperature of the sun changes or if the amount of radiation from the sun changes, that has a big effect on the, uh, the heat on the, on the temperature of the Earth. Similarly, um, if the Earth is further away from the sun, it has an effect, or, or closer to the sun, it has an effect. People don't know whether the sun uh, has constant energy output. Um, over the course of, so, so the sun is what's called the main sequence star, and it has, over the course of its lifetime of about 10 billion years, we're about halfway through, over the course of its lifetime, it will have different amounts of, uh, of, of, of radiation that it produces, different amounts of heat that it generates. Um, we are a G-type star, the sun is, and I think, uh, let's see, it's, I think the sequence is, is not very useful, is O-B-A-F-G-K-M. That's the, that's the sequence of types of stars, and those types of stars have characteristically different colors, different temperatures, different sizes, but as the star evolves, through this so-called main sequence of burning different kinds of, right now the sun is primarily getting its energy by the fusion of hydrogen atoms to make helium, but at different times in its history, there'll be different, uh, different uh, kinds of, of fusion that are dominant in, in the sun. But I think the, for the last, um, I don't know, billion years or so, I think the, um, uh, the, the, it's believed based on models of stellar, of the structure of stars that, um, the output, the heat output is probably more or less constant, I think. Um, but so then the question is, okay, so how much, how much temperature reaches the surface of the earth? And that depends as I say, on how far away the earth is from the sun. It also depends on the earth's atmosphere. Um, now I, I should say another thing, which is another potential source of heat on the earth is from inside the earth. I mean, the Earth, I think I mentioned this uh, other times, the Earth is hot inside. You drill down, you go down more than 50 miles, it'll be liquid, molten core. Um, and uh, it's, um, and that, that heat inside the Earth, about half of it right now in 4.6 billion years after the Earth started, about half of it is heat that's still remnant from when the Earth was first formed. When the Earth was formed, it was formed from the accretion of lots of of different things, even down at the level of, of, event, of grains of, of, of stuff and maybe at the level of individual atoms and so on, what were pushed together to make the earth. And in that process of, of pushing all that together, there's a certain amount of, there was heat from those things that was still remained, even when the things were pulled together by gravity. And about half of the internal heat of the earth is due to that. The other half is due to radioactive elements in the earth, which are things like uranium, um, that are decaying with uh, long decay times of, in the billions of years. Uh, and, and randomly, nuclei of uranium, for example, are sort of blowing up into smaller nuclei. And as they do that, 
those they release a lot of a lot of energy each one releases quite a lot of energy and that again heats the the interior of the earth and so at times in the history of the earth volcanoes for example where the the things from the liquid core of the earth spurt up into onto the earth's surface can be important in heating the earth that that's not the case right now so far as i know uh, and the only the only place where you get to really uh, you know sample the heat of the earth is in geothermal deep geothermal wells for example that's a that's a common place where people can sort of make use of the heat of the earth i mean i think in you know your typical kind of geothermal house uh, house heating and cooling system doesn't go down very deep and it uses the fact that in most places on the earth if you drill down the temperature of the rock is around 55 degrees fahrenheit at least that's true in in uh, in sort of temperate latitudes. I'm not completely certain that's true throughout the earth. But the point is during the year, there are places which get very hot and the, the air gets very hot, the air gets very cold. Right now around here, I think today it was like 90 degrees Fahrenheit where I am. Um, and you know it gets down to minus 10 degrees or something Fahrenheit at different times of year. So there's a big variation in the temperature at the surface. But if you go down inside the soil, inside the rock, you don't have to go very deep. You only have to go, uh, I don't know how far it is, you know, some number of feet before the variation through the year is absolutely minimal and where it's basically a constant 55 degrees Fahrenheit throughout the year. Um, that uh, it's because of the conduction of heat through the rock. It doesn't conduct the heat very quickly. And so in the course of the year, it really hasn't kind of the heat or cold hasn't really diffused deep into the rock. So the constant, the temperature is more or less constant. Now, if you drill down further, you will eventually get to where the rock starts to get hotter and hotter. Um, and that's a result of the heat coming from the center of the earth. And um, the, uh, when you drill you know, a mile deep, for example, it's really hot. Uh, when you drill a, a couple of miles deep, you're really getting a sort of huge amounts of geothermal uh, heating. Um, and if you can drill down, like for example, oil, oil wells, are often drilling a mile, I think even a couple of miles deep to get the layers of rock that were laid down in the Carboniferous period that correspond to the deposits of oil that come from sort of crushed plant matter from the Carboniferous period that's now turned into oil. Um, you drill down a mile or two and you can get to these deposits of that and then you can uh, pump, the, pump the liquid up, up to the surface and so on and um, and get um, uh, and get oil out of out of the earth, but when you're that deep, one thing that's true is things are just really hot down there. So the question is, how do you make use of that heat? And one thing you can do is you pump water down, and you, the water can be cold at the top. But by the time it's been pumped down, if you can get water that's been pumped down and it, uh, and then pump it back up again, the water that you get when you pump it up will be really hot. Um, now, it's a non-trivial thing to arrange sort of all the engineering of pumping cold water down, getting the hot water up. And, uh, you know, it, it tends to be the case. There's a huge development of the engineering of drilling oil wells. And there's sort of a standard, I don't know how big it is. It's like this big or something. It's a few inches, of, you know, foot across or something, I think, is the typical oil well size. And there are millions of such wells that have been drilled on the earth by now to try and extract oil from deposits and laid down in the Carboniferous period. And so there's lots of technology for drilling things about that size, which turns out not to be terrifically easy to pump water down and get other water back and so on. But that's a place where, that's one of the examples of where the heat of the earth is something that can be found at the surface if you build sort of geothermal, deep geothermal wells like that. I mean, there are places on the earth, like in Iceland, for example, where the, the sort of heat of the earth is much closer to the surface. There are lots of volcanoes and geysers and things like that. And that's the place where it's much easier to get geothermal energy. But anywhere on the earth, if you drill down a couple of miles, things will be really hot and you can use that to, to get energy. But most of the temperature of the surface of the earth has, is not to do with what's inside the earth. It's to do with the, uh, with the illumination from the sun. And it's to do with how much of that illumination gets down to the surface how much of it is trapped uh, between the the uh, how much of it how much of that illumination heats the surface and whether the surface when it's hot will radiate heat back into space 
So if the Earth had no atmosphere, it would be the case like the Moon has no atmosphere. The um, uh, well, it's there isn't an air to get heated or cooled on the Moon, but the surface of the Moon just gets really hot in the day and really cold at night. Um, and uh, because it's purely, uh, but it, it's heated by by direct radiation from the sun. But the important other issue is how much when when the when the Earth gets hot, how much of that heat is escapes through infrared radiation going back out of the Earth. And and one of the big issues is that depending on the on what's in the atmosphere, you can have a situation where visible light comes in, heats the Earth. But then, when that the the what comes back out from the heated Earth is infrared radiation at a different wavelength, and that wavelength can be blocked by, for example, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and that will prevent that heat from escaping back into space. So, if 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 all the all the energy that came in in light might heat the Earth, but then that energy would escape back into space then the, the total temperature of the atmosphere would not increase. But if you block it, then it does increase. And so uh, now it's a subtle thing because for example, you know, when, if there's a big volcanic explosion, for example, and it puts a whole bunch of small particles into the upper atmosphere, that will tend to block the light of the sun. And so it will make things cold. And so for example, 65 million years ago, when this, uh, uh, you know, asteroid hit the earth, that um, wiped out, well, finished off the dinosaurs. One of the things that happened was that it, it threw all this gunk into the upper atmosphere of the Earth, which made the it made the the uh, uh, the sky dark uh, throughout the the day as well as night, um, and that meant that for a year or two the surface of the Earth got really cold, and that was kind of bad news if you were a non cave dwelling dinosaur or something, um, and so and a cold-blooded reptile uh, type dinosaur. But so things like that, you can, you know, if you put like small particles into the upper atmosphere of the earth, you'll cool it down because you just block light from the sun. And for example, if right now, if we said, okay, let's turn the temperature of the earth down one degree centigrade, we can probably do that by just putting uh, little aerosol particles into the upper atmosphere of the earth. Whether that's a good idea, is a whole different story because once you do that, you cool down the whole earth by a degree centigrade, let's say. You don't get to make choices about, oh, well, actually, we just want it hotter here and colder there and so on. And it kind of has to be this big collective decision to, to do that, which is a difficult thing to, to, to decide to, to go for. But in any case, the, um, uh, there's this question about the formation of glaciers originally. And what happens is that the, the, um, the temperature of the earth varies and we get periods where there are ice ages and there are lots of glaciers that that form as a result of that because the average temperature goes down there are other cases where the, the earth heats up and um uh you know for example around the mid 1600s uh was a period of time when the earth was considerably colder than it is now and famously you know lots of rivers that now are like free-flowing rivers were at that time Sort of frozen over throughout the year. Uh, that time correlated with the absence of sunspots on the surface of the spot sun. And some people think that there was a variation of the of the heat produced by the sun as a result of that. I mean, sunspots, so when you when you look and don't look directly at the disk of the sun, but if you can if you can kind of let it go through a pinhole and and have some some image of it or something on, on the ground or whatever, um, or you have looked through some dark enough glass or something um, at the sun. Uh, actually, you, you can't see those, but the naked eye, you can't see sunspots. But, but if, you, if you have an, uh, an expanded image of the surface of the sun, or you look at the image that comes from, from spacecraft that are set up to look at the, look at the sun, um, you'll see there are these dark spots on the surface of the sun. And at any given time, there are, I don't know how many there are today, you know, 10, 15 dark spots on the surface of the sun. And you can look, you know, Wolfram Alpha has this data of the number of sunspots um, at any given time. And they vary day to day, week to week, uh, and so on. And there, there tends to be an 11 year cycle in the sun where there are uh, times when there's a solar minimum, solar maximum, a large number of sunspots, large amount of solar activity, smaller amount of solar activity. 
um, that might be related to the energy output of the sun. Uh, actual cause of sunspots is their essentially um, magnetic storms in the outer layers of the sun. The outer layer of the sun is kind of a plasma like fire um, on the on the earth. And there are places where there are uh, kind of uh, sort of like storms in in the structure of, of that of that outer atmosphere of the sun. Um, and sometimes there are places where, you know, there are uh, one of the things that people worry about quite a bit is so-called coronal mass ejections. Um, the corona is that atmosphere, that surface layer of the sun in which there are sunspots, these magnetic storms effectively, um, that show up as darker spots on the surface of the sun. Um, and uh, somewhere associated with those, there are sometimes these big blobs of, um, uh, of solar material that just get ejected into space. Um, and uh, that one of the results of that is if they kind of get it thrown in the direction of the Earth, um, they have a lot of radioactivity that they produce, a lot of electromagnetic activity, and um, there's a uh, that can have all kinds of effects on the Earth. So it's as if there's a, a sort of a giant um, uh, electrical thing that that goes near the Earth, and when that happens, it produces a lot of electrical effects on the Earth. I think there's one. When was it? The Carrington uh, event was, I think, 1859, if I remember right. Um, was a big coronal mass ejection um, where uh, this sort of big electrical effects happened on the earth. And at that time, you know, telegraph wires, there were lots of telegraph wires going around the world and a bunch of those got huge voltages induced on them and all sorts of bad things happened. Um, quite what would happen in that kind of um, event in modern times with satellites and and so much electrical machinery and, and uh, systems on the earth is not completely clear. And, you know, electrical transformer stations will probably start blowing up because they have too much voltage that is induced in the wires going into them from these uh, electrical effects from the coronal mass ejection and so on. But there are at least, there's at least some warning that exists today because there are satellites that watch um, the, uh, watch the surface of the sun um, and try and uh, detect these kinds of things. And we have, oh, I don't know how long it is. It's, um, I don't know how fast these things go, maybe 30 minutes, maybe more of warning because these things, we get to see what's happening on the surface of the sun at the speed of light. So it takes eight minutes for light to go from the sun to the earth. Um, but so we will see something, you know, uh, that happens on the surface of the sun, but the, all of these electrons and, and protons and so on that are part of this coronal mass ejection, they're going slower than the speed of light. And so we get to see what happened before that big blob of stuff arrives at the earth and has whatever effects it has. Well, let's see, that was a long answer. Um, uh, let's see, oh gosh, there's all kinds of questions here related to this. Um, Eggy is asking, is the order of the earth constant around the sun or is there a variation on large time frame? Frame. Can it explain ice ages? Uh, yes, there are variations on long time scales. Um, and I am not completely remembering what the origin of all of those is. But the whole structure of, of sort of planetary orbits in the solar system is pretty complicated. I mean, the, the sort of simple high school physics version is planets orbit stars in ellipses. In a first approximation, they orbit in circles. They're just a constant distance away from the star. But more accurately, they orbit in an ellipse, which gets some um, during the year, one time of the year, it's it, well, the, the, there's, there's a very small eccentricity to that ellipse. There's a very small deviation from being circular. So there's a very small an ellipse. You can define a circle. You just define circle has a radius. You've got the center of the circle and every point on the circle is an equal distance from the center of the circle. In an ellipse, the thing is smooshed. And so there's a semi-major axis where it's kind of a long diameter, and well, a long radius, and then a semi-minor axis that's the shorter radius because it's a smooshed circle. And the orbit of the Earth is a smooshed circle, and I don't remember its eccentricity. I'm thinking it's like one part in a thousand, but I'm not sure if that's right. Um, easy to look up in Wolfram Alpha. Um, the uh, uh, and that, um, but so during the year, 
the Earth is slightly closer to the sun at one time than it is at another time, the axis of that ellipse doesn't move very much. Um, in a perfect inverse square law model of gravity, it doesn't move at all. But things happen because of the effects of, of uh, planets other than uh, it's not just the Earth and the sun in the picture. Even the moon has an effect, but more so Jupiter has a substantial effect. Other planets have an effect. And the full story of, of how the orbits of, uh, in the solar system work is really complicated. It's complicated enough that, for example, we don't really know uh, going back. Well, certainly, I think these days it's a few hundred million years. We still know more or less which planets were where and things didn't get. No planets got ejected from the solar system on that time frame. But if you go back a billion years or two billion years, much less clear and there could easily have been extra planets that just got ejected from the solar system and so on. So the answer is that there are, it is a complicated pattern, that the, the orbit of the Earth is complicated, and there are these cycles that um, uh, can affect the um, uh, certainly the, the average distance of the Earth from the sun, and so can have an effect on, on the temperature of the Earth. Um, the, uh, let's see. Um, Uh, oh my gosh, so many, so many questions here. Um, oh, wow. There's another, lots of questions about lots of different topics. There's a question about, um, uh, from Aaron about aerial photographs of ocean waves. All right, let's, let's talk a little bit about ocean waves since we're on this kind of geo, geological Oh, I don't know, earth science kick here. Um, so everybody's seen kind of waves on the ocean and waves are just this whole phenomenon that happen in lots of different situations. You can have waves on a slinky spring. You can have waves on a string. Waves happen whenever there's sort of, whenever you sort of push things in one direction and there's a force that pulls them back to being, uh, to to sort of a restoring force and then it overshoots and it goes back and it's like a pendulum swinging back and forth. And there are, there are many different forms of waves. In an ocean, there are waves where the water is pushed up and as it's pushed up, it's pulled more down by gravity. And so it, it goes down, but, it, but as it's pulled down, it's sort of running so fast that it overshoots and it gets pulled too far down and then it gets pulled up again and so on. If you were to kind of take a slice through a typical ocean wave, what you find is if you looked at the actual molecules of water, you'd find they're going in circles. The ocean wave is the, the molecules going up, it's going down, it's coming back in, it's, it's sort of going around in a circle. Now, if you look at the surface of the ocean, it seems to be undulating in, in waves, but the actual uh, pieces of water are going in circles inside that wave. Now, actually, there are several different kinds of waves on, on water. There are so-called, um, uh, let's see, deep water waves, which are the main ones you see in the ocean, yes. Uh, there are surface waves and there are surface tension waves. There are surface waves which are just affecting, oh no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The, the, the waves that are, that are the main ocean waves are actually uh, surface waves because they affect, they're just, um, waves where the, where, the, where the pieces of water are, are sort of circulating at the, near the surface of the water, as opposed to uh, deep water waves where it matters what the bottom of the ocean is like. The, the, the typical waves you see on an ocean which are sort of crashing on the beach are not ones where it matters what, the, what happens at the bottom of the ocean. And, and so what, what, um, when, when you see those waves sort of crashing on the beach, one thing that's often surprising is how random the succession of, of kind of uh, wave, uh, sort of wave arrivals is. They're roughly equally spaced, but they're always, you know, one wave is bigger, another wave is smaller and so on. And so what causes that? Well, first thing to know is that first question is how do the waves get produced on the ocean? They get produced by wind blowing on the ocean and sort of ruffling up the surface of the ocean. And so then what you're seeing is kind of a typically when there's lots of activity of ocean, ocean waves, you're seeing some storm that might have happened hundreds of miles or more away um, in, in the ocean. And there are 
waves that were generated by that storm. And those waves have been traveling across the surface of the ocean um, until they finally get to the beach you're at. And then they, they kind of break at, at the beach. Now, also what you see is as, as waves approach a beach, as the uh, eventually, I mentioned that sort of the, the water is going around in these circles, eventually the circles are too big to fit in the depth of water that exists near that beach. And so that's why the waves break. They, they, they'll have these, um, uh, they will no longer be just able to sort of undulate the surface of the water up and down. They'll instead have this kind of form where they, where they break and they produce, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, bubbles and things like that. So, and, and, and spray and so on. So, so in any case, there, there are, uh, now if you ask the question, why is the sort of, why is it complicated? Why is the surface of the ocean complicated? Well, it's because there are interactions between these different trains of waves. First of all, the storm can have a complicated form. Second of all, when you produce trains of waves, they can interact in complicated ways where they don't just pass through each other. Sometimes if you'll see a, a bunch of waves, you know, if you, if you drop one, uh, one stone in water, one place, another stone, another place, you'll get these circular waves that come out. And if the waves are, are small enough, you'll typically see just simple interaction between those waves um, where you get sort of the, the waves adding in some places, subtracting in others and so on. Um, but when the waves are bigger, you'll have more complicated interactions between the waves. And it won't be the case that you can just sort of add up the, the heights of the water from those two waves. And I think that's that's part of why the sort of there's, there's complicated behavior in kind of these ocean waves. In general, there's a certain sort of spectrum of wave heights that exists in the, in the ocean. Um, and when people design boats, for example, they're saying, what's the chance there'll be such a big wave that it will you know, capsize the boat or something like this. And uh, uh, there's, it's, it's known that there's a, a sort of a power law distribution of sizes of waves. And so one can get an estimate of, of make sure, making sure that probability is, is small enough. I mean, on, on the deep ocean, there's, you know, there's the swell, which is this sort of undulating, um, uh, you know, the, the, this, this surface undulation of the, of the water. I mean, there are other things that happen like tsunamis, for example, if there's an earthquake under the ocean, there'll be sort of the, the bottom of the ocean will move. You'll get one of these deep water waves, which will get this, this sort of big, big, uh, you'll get a bunch of water that's being, that's moves across the ocean and tsunamis can, can propagate across, will propagate across a whole ocean. When they're in the deep, deep ocean, they typically don't have a very big effect on the, on the, uh, on the sort of height of the water there but they're very long and big. And, and, and so the total amount of water that's in a tsunami can be extremely large, even though it might only be you know, a fraction of an inch in, in difference of, of height there. But then when the, when the tsunami gets towards land, it's kind of bad news because there's just a huge pile of water that's coming towards the land and it bunches up and it, it ends up being this giant wall of water that can be you know, hundreds of feet high and things like that. And it's some... It's, um, uh, that's something where these days, well, in the Pacific Ocean for a while, there have been tsunami early warning systems. Actually, they happened to be built originally, I think, with modeling using our our uh, software uh, technology. Um, but in any case, the the there's sort of an early warning system for tsunamis where there are where there are detectors of of small waves in the ocean. Um, there weren't in the Indian Ocean uh, such such early warning systems. What was it? Um, Oh gosh, how long ago was it? Like 15 years ago, there was a big tsunami that sort of went all the way across the Indian Ocean, that caused all kinds of trouble. Um, and uh, uh, that, that's an example of a deep water, uh, deep water ocean waves. All right, let's see. So many questions here. I should get faster at answering these. Um, uh, As a question from Brady, what are neutrinos for? Why do they exist if they don't interact with anything? Could aliens have a purpose for them? Well, I don't think we know why neutrinos exist, just like we don't know why electrons exist um, or why muons, which are kind of a, a heavier version of electrons, 206 times heavier than electrons, exist. There are actually three kinds of so-called leptons, things like electrons that uh, um, behave as electrons do, they interact with, they have electric charge, 
but they don't interact directly through strong, uh, through strong nuclear force through quantum chromodynamics. They can't get bound inside a nucleus. That's only protons and neutrons. Um, electrons have electromagnetic charge. They also have a thing, a weak charge that um, uh, is related to uh, their effect in, in uh, well, in, in weak interactions, which are associated with things like beta decay. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, the, uh, but so electrons uh, have a, a certain mass, about 1,800 times less than the mass of a proton. Uh, there are muons that have a mass 206 times the mass of the electron. There are things called tau leptons that have a mass about 3,000 times the mass of the electron. Nobody knows why muons and tau leptons exist. Um, they kind of go along with uh, strange and charm quarks and top and bottom quarks, but nobody knows why there are those extra generations of, of particles. So uh, we don't know why those things exist. But along with the electron, there is a thing called the electron neutrino. And uh, the first place that was observed was in nuclear beta decay, where, uh, for example, well, typically nuclei that have too many neutrons in them uh, will decay. And the neutrons in one of the neutrons in the nucleus will kind of explode and produce a proton, an electron, and something else. And the something else is an antineutrino. And neutrino is a kind of particle, like electrons, like quarks, like other kinds of things, just a kind of particle, but it happens to have no electric charge. Um, and it has no uh, nuclear charge either, no strong nuclear charge either. So it's, it's a thing that doesn't interact. It, it doesn't interact electromagnetically. And so that means that it doesn't interact very much at all. It will go through, you know, you shoot a neutrino at, at, a, at a, 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 a concrete block and if it's a low enough energy neutrino, it'll just go straight through the concrete block. In fact, neutrinos go straight through the Earth. There are lots of neutrinos coming from the sun, and most of them just go straight through the Earth. Now, it's a little bit strange because many particles, when they're more energetic, they're less likely to interact with something. But neutrinos go, at least for, for many energy levels, um, go the op opposite way. The probability that a neutrino interacts increases like the square of its energy. And the, the reasons for that are a little bit like I could explain, but let me not digress onto why that happens. Um, but basically neutrinos, so if you have a higher energy neutrino, it has a, a higher chance to interact. And um, neutrinos are only detected by seeing, it's hard to, the, people don't know how to directly detect a neutrino. The only way to detect a neutrino is to see that it hits another particle and you see that other particle, it, it interacts with another particle and, uh, and does something. So for example, a typical thing would be neutrino hits um, something and produces an electron. And you can see the electron because the electron has electromagnetic effects. You can detect it by its electromagnetic, it, it's uh, essentially electrical effects. Um, but neutrinos don't work that way. So neutrinos are, kind of, um, uh, they're produced by nuclear reactions. They're produced by nuclear beta decay. Whenever there's sort of an excess of neutrons, you eventually produce neutrinos. The new, if you could separate a neutron from a nucleus, neutrons are rather stable. They last about 15 minutes on average, um, but eventually they'll, they'll sort of decay into protons, electrons, and antineutrinos. Um, again, from the sun, where there are nuclear reactions happening, there's a big stream of neutrinos. From any nuclear reactor, there are, there are neutrinos produced. So for example, the neutrinos from nuclear reactors um, are fairly energetic neutrinos, so they're a little bit easier to detect, or many of them are fairly energetic neutrinos. And so people talk about, you know, if you want to tell whether a nuclear reactor is running, you can, you know, put a van nearby that has something which detects the neutrinos, and you can tell that there's a nuclear reactor running there. So for example, I, I think I may have told the story before, but sometime in the 1980s, uh, uh, one of the things that um, was experienced of mine was, well, let me, let me explain that nuclear submarines work by having nuclear reactors in them. And those nuclear reactors can, can power submarines for, for years. 
without them having to refuel. So those submarines can just go into a deep ocean and hang out there and nobody knows where they are. And if the submarines have lots of missiles that they can launch and so on, it's like nobody knows where those missiles are. And they could, you know, if if uh, if everything uh, sort of goes bad, the the uh, the submarine is still there and it's able to launch its missiles, at least if it can have somebody tell it to do that. Um, so the point of having all these submarines hanging out in the deep ocean is nobody knows where they are. And uh, they can just sort of hang out and, and not be destroyed if people come and attack other things on land and so on. Well, that works just fine so long as it's really true you don't know where the submarines are. But the submarines have nuclear reactors in them, and their nuclear reactors produce neutrinos. And if you could detect neutrinos easily, you could tell where the nuclear submarines are. So I was interested in... Um, uh, neutrino detection, actually, particularly from the early universe back in the 1980s. And I was trying to figure out, is there a way to efficiently detect neutrinos? Most things can't do that. One of the reasons it's possible to detect electromagnetic radiation, radio waves and so on, is that you can so-called coherently detect it. If you have a whole bunch of atoms that are being, that are and the radio wave goes through all those atoms, sort of all the electrons in those atoms kind of move in, 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 a, in a synchronous way, in a coherent way. And they have an effect that if you have N atoms, it's about N squared effect on all those atoms. And that, that means when you have lots of atoms, you can kind of detect the effect of the electromagnetic wave, the radio wave, for example. With neutrinos, in the most obvious way that neutrinos interact with things, you don't have such an effect. So if you have N atoms, you only have N times the effect uh, from the neutrinos coming through, not N squared. But I thought maybe there was a way to get an N squared effect by using this, uh, well, the so-called A phase of, of liquid helium-3, which is a very strange substance that has various, a, a strange kind of superfluid behavior. So I thought maybe there was a way to detect neutrinos coherently and therefore make a pretty good neutrino detector, something which would actually notice the presence of neutrinos in ways that normal neutrino detectors would not. And so if one could do that, you could have a satellite that would have all this weird, uh, you know, helium-3, liquid helium-3 in it and uh, carefully lined up magnetically and all kinds of other things. And it would be a detector of neutrino, of streams of neutrinos from the Earth. In particular, it would show up, the, the nuclear submarines would show up as hot spots in the oceans of the Earth where there were lots of neutrinos being produced. Well, the difficulty as a practical matter was in the 1980s, in the middle of the Cold War, um, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, what would happen if, if somebody suddenly says, oh, by the way, there's this way to detect where all the nuclear submarines are. This is a, a, a weird sort of geopolitical thing to have happen. And I was very, uh, you know, because I thought I'd figured out something about the science of how this might work. And it's like, what do you do with information like that um, at that kind of time in history? And so I was actually, it was one of those cases where uh, I was very happy that the, that the science didn't work out uh, the way that it seemed like it was working out. And it turns out that method of detecting neutrinos won't work, or at least it doesn't work in, at a practical level. And so, no, you couldn't detect where all the nuclear submarines were. So that was a, that was a good thing as far as I was concerned at the time. But people have thought about, you know, when there are neutrinos that stream through the Earth, maybe you could essentially x-ray the Earth with neutrinos. You could look for, you know, deposits of minerals in the Earth and things like that by looking at the absorption of neutrinos as they go in different directions through the Earth. But that's, um, uh, uh, that's kind of a little bit of the story of neutrinos. There are actually three different kinds of neutrinos that we know, actually six altogether. The neutrino associated with the electron, the neutrino associated with the muon, the neutrino associated with the tau lepton, and their anti-versions, their antiparticle versions also. And those neutrinos have a very small, well, it's a little bit of a complicated thing. They have a very tiny mass, and they actually mix. So electron neutrinos essentially turn into muon neutrinos at a small rate and so on. Um, and that's still a little bit not completely worked out how that exactly uh, uh, is set up, but that's the basic idea. And so a question would be, uh, neutrinos, by the way, are, are sufficiently low mass that they more or less travel at the speed of light. If they were of zero mass, they would travel exactly at the speed of light, but they travel more or less at the speed of light. 
And so, for example, if there's a supernova explosion, you expect a burst of neutrinos at more or less the same time that you get a burst of, of, of light from the, um, from the explosion. Now, the question was asked here, uh, could aliens have a purpose for neutrinos? Yeah, well, I think this whole question of what aliens are like is a complicated thing. But, you know, could one do in principle neutrino astronomy? Could one observe kind of uh, sort of neutrino things going on in the universe? Eventually, yes, we'll presumably be able to do that. Just like we can observe gravitational waves, but it takes a very big detector to observe the very small effect of gravitational waves. And we only tend to observe gravitational waves when there's a big burst of them from, for example, a merger of two black holes, which releases an amount of energy in gravitational waves that's like converting the whole of the sun into energy in a matter of a second or so. So a huge amount of energy that we can detect from essentially anywhere in the universe with the gravitational wave detectors that we have now that are a few miles long and so on. Um, presumably one day it will be possible to detect neutrino bursts in the same way from, from violent events like supernovas, although the total amount of, of, of energy released in, in neutrinos, I think is quite small compared to the amount of energy released in gravitational waves in a black hole merger. Um, but still, that's the, that's the kind of thing one can expect to have, have happen there. Um, so there's a question here from RBS, didn't neutrinos cause hardware failure in airplanes? No, absolutely not. Um, the neutrinos have an absolutely infinitesimally tiny effect on sort of world affairs. There are cosmic rays that are that come from the sun is spewing out all kinds of things, but it spews out light. It also spews out protons that are uh, that are the, on average have a have an energy um, that uh, makes them well that they, they have a an energy that's about equal to their rest mass one GeV um, come from the sun, and those stream towards the Earth. Um, many of them are uh, they sort of uh, are caught by the magnetic field of the Earth. They tend to spiral in towards the poles, which is what leads to the auroras and things like that, as those interact with the with the molecules in the upper atmosphere of the Earth, um, atoms rather in the upper atmosphere of the Earth. Um, the uh, uh, then then, but um, no, the, the cosmic rays are in at at high altitudes. Cosmic rays are mostly protons. Um, at lower altitudes, when when they've had to go through more of the atmosphere, they're mostly muons. Um, and those those sort of survive more to the surface. I have to say, I, I have this little particle detector that somebody gave me that's a thing that images particle tracks. Um, finally, it's possible to have sort of a, a, a home version of such a thing that um, you can just plug into your computer. And I have this, and, and it, it, it's been sitting connected to my computer, and it, it, it shows a cosmic ray muon going through it maybe, oh, I don't know, a uh, couple of times a minute at more or less sea level where I live. But I decided to take it on a plane a little while ago and at the altitude of the plane, you know, whatever it was, 36,000 feet or something, the thing was just going crazy. Um, it, was, uh, it was showing, you know, cosmic rays going through it all the time. That's a lot more primary protons. It had these weird little Vs that I think are strange particle production um, from cosmic rays, although I really need to check that. Um, that uh, so it's it's a really a big effect on, on on difference in the way in the level of cosmic rays at the altitude of a plane, um, uh, you know, let's say uh, what is it, um, uh, tenish miles um, up. Is that right? Then um, uh, then um, in uh, uh, then at sea level and so on. Let's see, maybe one or two more. Uh, Okay, the question, if, if, if technology could produce a small practical neutrino emitter and detector, would it be useful to send messages with them? Sure. Um, just as it is with electromagnetic radiation. I mean, I mentioned submarines, and the, the problem with communicating with submarines is water absorbs uh, things like radio waves and so on, mostly. But if you have a sufficiently long wavelength radio wave, a wavelength of miles long radio wave, it's still possible to detect those even through the ocean. Those go through the ocean, they go through the whole earth actually. Sufficiently low, uh, uh, low frequency, long wavelength radio waves can, can get through lots of things. And so, so submarines tend to have these giant mile long antennas that they trail behind them for detecting those kinds of, um, 
uh, very extra low frequency ELF um, radio waves. I think it's the case. I don't know if it's still true. I think it's true that in, I think it's Wisconsin, there's a giant antenna. that's a many, many, many tens of miles long antenna that is used to send signals to submarines. Um, when you have that long a wavelength, you have a very low frequency. And so that means you can only send signals at an incredibly slow rate of, you know, one bit per second or something. Um, but it's still possible to send those signals sort of anywhere on the earth. And neutrinos uh, can have, uh, can be sort of get through rock and all those kinds of things, but they can exist. In principle, you could, if you had a way to modulate a neutrino beam, if you had a way to sort of, well, actually it's easy. Well, if you had a way to, to change the intensity of the neutrino beam, it will be like amplitude modulated radio. Um, you could probably send, uh, you could send signals um, at perfectly high data rates, even going through large chunks of rock, you know, communicating with uh, uh, to people in caves or whatever else you want to do. And yes, that would work with neutrinos and you could send them, if you could detect the neutrinos well enough, you could be, you know, uh, streaming their favorite video show or something, the TV show down to a cave so to speak, and, and getting it to go through the rock and so on. If you could make a neutrino detector that would work efficiently enough, which we don't currently know how to do. Um, let's see. Uh, the question here. Oh boy, let's see, so many different things here. Um, the questions uh, from Vass, will holograms as seen in the Iron Man movies ever be available for widespread use? Uh, so first of all, what is a hologram? So normally when we see things, we see things because uh, light hits the thing, the photons of light, kind of essentially bounce off the thing and get to our eye and we see those photons. And so normally we're just seeing photons that directly come from, it's kind of like goes from the light to the object to our eye. But things are actually in a sense more subtle than that because light doesn't just behave like little particles of light, like little photons of, of particles of light. It also behaves like a wave where you can have, where essentially you have, well, it's, it's an electromagnetic wave. It's got intensities of electricity and magnetism um, that are on a very tiny scale that are going in a certain direction at the speed of light. And those, that, that sort of the, the, you can think of what you see from an object as being kind of a front of waves from that object that are where the where the direction of those waves corresponds to the direction you would say the photon was going in. But you can really think of the light as being either a whole collection of photons, a whole collection of sort of correlated photons, or as a wave that has sort of um, uh, in high and low intensity uh, electricity and magnetism on a very tiny scale, on a scale that's like... Um, uh, 100 trillionth of a, one, one, uh, well, 10 billionth of a meter um, in, in, uh, in, in size. So, okay. So when light gets to our eyes, it is, we can think of it as all these photons getting to our eyes or this wave front of all these little electromagnetic waves getting to our eyes. But one thing we can do is to kind of form those waves as they are when they get to our eyes in some kind of special way that isn't just having the light bounce off an object and come to our eyes. And what holograms are doing is to have a way to, to sort of form the structure of the light in such a way that it is as if the light came from objects in a certain way, but it's just forming those wave fronts of light in such a way that when they get to our eye, We'll, we'll say, well, that must have come from an object like this, but it's just the, the, the wave front was sort of specially formed. And so in a hologram, what you'll end up with is something that is something where you have uh, something like a mirror, but it's a mirror that has little sort of tiny 
uh, changes, tiny sort of uh, um, uh, tiny sort of features on it that will uh, um, will affect uh, uh, tiny features that are actually at, at distances smaller than the wavelength of light um, that will sort of form this wave front that um, uh, that we perceive. So one of the things that hasn't yet been possible is to make a device that has that produces a hologram in real time that actually has is like like you know the the com a computer display has uh, little pieces of liquid crystal or light emitting diodes um, that are little semiconductor devices where every pixel on the screen is being independently controlled by putting voltage uh, to it and that causes uh, photons to be emitted there. But the thing that that is sort of a thing that one is working towards is being able to have a holographic display in which the um, uh, the 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 um, uh, the, those places where the light is being produced are so close together that they are smaller than the wavelength of light. And that means that one can sort of form this, this wave front that of light in whatever way one chooses. So if one could have a real time, sort of a holographic movie that was being produced in real time. So our display is not producing just separately all those pixels, but all those different pixels are producing things which are sort of uh, 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 coherent pieces of light that are all sort of forming this wave front that eventually gets to our eye. Well, if we can do that, and we can do that in real time, then we can make light which will appear to our eyes to be coming from whatever we want it to be coming from. So that would be an example. That, that's how one would make something which is a hologram. And a hologra in a hologram, because we're, we're sort of getting that wave front of light that could come from anything, it can appear to come from this object in three dimensions as you move your head, you're seeing different parts of those wave fronts and you're seeing things from different angles and so on. You're seeing something that is uh, sort of just like the, uh, the, the light that will be formed coming from the, from the object that you're, you're dealing with. So, so eventually it will probably be possible to have uh, sort of a, a display that operates down at the level that where the features are smaller in the wavelength of light. And so you'll be able to have a, a sort of real-time hologram created. So I, I would expect that that will be a thing that will be possible. Now, now at some level, you might say, who cares? Because if you, you know, we sense the depth of objects, we sense the distance objects are away, more or less from the fact that they look a little different from our right eye and our left eye, and we're fusing those two images together in our brains, and that as those images are fused, they're slightly different from the left eye and right eye. The further away an object is, the more the same the images will be from the left eye and the right eye, and the closer the object is, the more different they'll be just because of the angles that, that uh, the eyes make to the object. And so if we have a head-mounted display or, or some other display, you know, some, some kind of glasses where, where we have slightly different images that we're showing in two different eyes, we will still have the impression of having, um, uh, of having something which, is in, uh, which has depth because we're kind of fooling our eyes into thinking that um, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the slightly different images, and so we can, we can sort of mock up what um, uh, uh, the, the depth of the object that way. And that's been a technology that's existed with you know, red and green glasses or polarizing glasses, things like that forever. And these days in, in head mounted displays and so on is a, and, and for virtual reality and such like is a, is a standard kind of technology. The tricky thing there is as you turn your head, the image better change. Um, and that's a tricky thing to achieve. And there tends to be lag in that which leads people like me to get horribly motion sick in, in most existing virtual reality systems and such like. Um, let's see. Uh, well, maybe um, it's a question here from Aaron. Why do some foods like peanuts and crustaceans cause deadly allergic reactions um, while other people eat them daily without harm. How many species have allergies? Oh boy, we're in a quite different topic here. Okay, what are allergic reactions? Well, the thing, our immune system is, uh, its purpose is 
when something that isn't us gets into us, the immune system wants to attack it and get rid of it. So for example, if bacteria, bacterial cells infect us, we want to be able to tell our immune system wants to be able to tell when something is circulating in our blood, for example, oh, that's a bacterial cell. It's not something that came from us. We should attack it and get rid of that bacterial cell. Or when a cell has been infected by a virus, uh, we should be able to tell that's a cell infected by a virus. We don't like it. It's not something of us. Let's get rid of it. So the immune system has a couple of different parts, the innate part and the adaptive part. The part of relevance here is the adaptive part. What happens is there are, it actually has two components, B cells and T cells, antibodies and, and T cell receptors. Um, the, um, the, what, what happens is, uh, how do you tell whether something is a, a piece of us or not? Well, let's assume everything is made of proteins which is the case for organic material. Um, the uh, uh, proteins are sequence of, uh, of amino acids, they're chains of amino acids, and each protein is specified by genomic sequence, sequence of base pairs, where triples of base pairs, three base pairs together, define an amino acid, then you chain those amino acids together to get proteins. And once you've chained those amino acids together, the proteins fold up in complicated ways because some amino acids uh, attract each other, some repel each other. It's a very complicated thing to determine exactly into what shape proteins will fold, although it's a problem that with modern machine learning, one seems to have a pretty good idea of how that will work, at least for proteins that are at least somewhat similar to the proteins that we actually see in biology, where we know we can sort of train the machine learning system on those kinds of proteins. So in any case, you, you have these proteins, they form into these complicated shapes, but more importantly, the proteins are made from sequences of amino acids. Okay, so now how does the immune system work? Well, the immune system generates, let's say the, let's talk about the antibody part of the immune system. It has about a hundred billion, I think, different kinds of antibodies that it can make. Each antibody is a small piece of protein is a small sequence, it's actually part of a larger protein, so-called hypervariable region of immunoglobulins. Of, of, um, it's, it's part of, of the, um, uh, a piece of, our, of antibodies, for example, is a piece of protein that is randomly generated. So it generates, I don't know what it is, length nine or 12, I forget, of that order, of the order 10 amino acids that are sort of randomly generated. So every time our immune system produces anti an antibody. Every, well, every time a, a B cell in our immune system uh, is made, it will be it will have a different sequence there, and so it will generate a different anti an antibody with a different sequence. And there are about hundred billion different kinds of different possible sequences. So the way our immune system works is it's generating randomly generating hundred billion different kinds of of, of antibodies. But then what happens is when you have an antigen, a, a, a thing that um, uh, uh, is a foreign uh, thing, an invader, so to speak, um, that invader will have some protein in it. That protein will have all kinds of sequences of amino acids in it. And some sequence of amino acids inside the protein inside that antigen will match uh, one of the will will typically match, um, you know, one or a few of those antibodies from that collection of 100 billion different kinds of antibodies. And the way the immune system works is, as soon as an antibody successfully binds to, successfully matches an antigen, that's noticed, and more and more of those kinds of antibodies are produced. And so, and that, um, and, and those antibodies, what the more and more of them that are produced they kind of tag pieces of the antigen and then the rest of the immune system comes and attacks things that have been tagged by antibodies. But the basic point is that uh, what's happening is the, the proteins um, that are in anything are being continually checked by the immune system. The immune system, these antibodies, there's 100 billion different kinds of antibodies. They're continually kind of jostling up against different kinds of cells and proteins and so on that exist in us. And they're continually trying to make that match. And most of the time, the match isn't going to be made. Most of the time, it's like, ah, oh, we don't care about that. 
it's uh, it doesn't match you know i the the particular antibody with a particular amino acid sequence don't match this particular thing move on let's go try and check check and see if we match something else okay so this idea of matching things uh, with antibodies is sort of the basic idea of the adaptive immune system but there's sort of a, a an issue there which is the adaptive immune system doesn't want to go into action on cells that are actually pieces of us. It wants to say, oh, that's a piece of us. I know what that is. I don't have to worry about that. Move on. Only when I see a, a, an amino acid sequence that isn't something that is a piece of us should I go and start attacking it. And so how does that work? Well, when we're born, we start training, probably before we're born, actually, we start training our immune system to say, these are things that are parts of us, and these are things that are not. So our, our, we have a you know, genome that's 6 billion base pairs long. That means there are many, many, many possible sequences of 6 or 12 or whatever it is, amino acids, that, that occur in that, giant, in that giant genome, and that are made use of in the proteins that exist in our bodies. And so each one of those is is kind of um, uh, we, we can we can kind of look at each of those sequences, each of those little blocks of sequence, and we can say, well, from the six billion base pairs that we have, there are zillions of sequences that are that are that are sequences that are represent us. They don't represent that foreign invader. They represent us, and so we have to learn the ones that represent us. And in our early life, we do that. The thymus gland in our, in our chest is, is, a, is a big piece of, of doing that, of sort of parading. Um, essentially, what's happening is one sort of parading uh, uh, their the, the cells being, being one, one's noticing which antibodies are uh, so recognize things that are us. And then what happens is by the time we're kind of teenagers and things, the, we're, we're done, we're trained, our immune system is trained, it knows what's us and what's not us. Well, that's how it's supposed to work. But autoimmune diseases arise because things like, you know, asthma, type 1 diabetes, uh, I don't know, celiac disease, um, uh, in the end, um, multiple sclerosis, lots of other diseases, they arise from autoimmunity. That is, the immune system turning against the cells of our own body. And that happens because, well, nobody knows completely why it happens, but the, the effect is that it isn't the case that when that we, we didn't correctly train our adaptive immune system. Uh, actually, it's more relevant. Uh, antibodies are kind of things that just go mark cells for attack by other parts of the immune system. There are also T cells that have these things called T cell receptors a little bit like antibodies, T cell receptors directly bind to cells and the T cells can then kind of directly attack cells. And that's more what happens, I think, in, in most autoimmune diseases. But um, in any case, the, the T cell receptors are trained in the same way that antibodies are trained. And the, so what happens in autoimmunity is that the um, uh, one, one attacks cells of one's own, so to speak. Now, okay, how do allergies work? Um, what's happening there? Well, what's happening there is one's getting a sort of excessive reaction to a particular uh, protein in some antibody, uh, antigen. And I'm now, oh my gosh, uh, forgetting how that cascade works of, um, oh yeah, I, I think. Hmm. Well, so I think the question that was was partly asked is why do people get allergic to peanuts and 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 shellfish and things like this, and why are many more people allergic to things like peanuts than are allergic to other kinds of things, and why are certain people allergic to that? And and I think the basic answer is that uh, the immune system. Well, let's see. The, I mean, what, what's happening is that the immune system is mounting 
too large a response to that little piece of peanut protein um, far beyond what it should be mounting. And it fails to, to uh, stop mounting that, that attack. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the question of sort of how the immune system stops attacking things is also a complicated issue. Because as soon as you generate all those antibodies or all those T cells with particular T cell receptors, you're generating lots of these cells. And the question is, those cells have never been seen before or not in large numbers because they have some, some weird sequence on them that, that is sort of the, the, the negative of the sequence on the antigen. And they, again, you know, why aren't those generating themselves an immune response? Well, the, the, there's a theory that says that they actually are and that to every antibody, there's also an anti-antibody that's generated, an anti-antibody, anti-anti-antibody, and so on. And there's a whole dynamic cascade, this whole network of interactions between antibodies and anti-antibodies and so on. And that's maintained in some kind of dynamic equilibrium. And that's probably what immune memory is associated with. And so I actually don't know how this works offhand. I, I'm, I certainly have known this in the past. Sorry, I've, I've, I've forgotten exactly how this works. Um, the, uh, you know, when there's sort of an excessive reaction and when there, there's a failure to mediate that reaction. Um, I, actually, I think, I think it is to do with, I mean, what, what happens is T cells interact with T cells. That's a very known thing. And I think it's the, the mediation of, um, uh, of those, of, of, of T cells by other T cells that is what causes there not to be an excessive um, immune reaction to a thing. And when that system doesn't work quite right, you end up getting this kind of excessive immune reaction and you end up getting T cells that in many cases of these autoimmune diseases um, will go and start attacking uh, cells that are part of, of, uh, of one's own body. But, but I'm, I'm, um, 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 I'm, a, I'm a little bit muddy on this. I have to, I have to go look at those immunology books again. Um, the uh, um, uh, yeah, there's a, a question from Wabu asking, do we know the mechanism behind the training? Yeah, I mean, what basically is happening is if they bind, that's noticed. If they don't bind, it's not, it, it's, uh, uh, you know, so so in our early life, we see some of this binding happening and that is, that is detected. Although I admit that, that isn't a full explanation. So I, I'm not sure that that is fully known. I mean, one of the things that is just the most, you know, biology has advanced a lot in the last few decades. And, you know, it used to be the case, people just said, oh, there are white blood cells. But then people realized there are different types of white blood cells. There are uh, B cells that produce antibodies. There are T cells. There are uh, cells with different proteins on their surface, you know, CD8 positive T uh, uh, cells. There are other kinds of cells. There are, there's this huge diversity of different kinds of, of cells associated with the immune system. And, you know, what used to be just the simple, oh, there are a couple of different kinds. I was looking at an, an immunology book recently, and there are pages and pages and pages of different, just a summary of different kinds of cells that are known to exist. So it's a pretty complicated thing. And there are pathways that are known, particularly through these substances called interleukins, which are sort of uh, uh, molecules that sort of communicate globally in the immune system. Um, they're what lead to uh, sort of the triggering of, of reactions like inflammation and so on. And it's a it's a complicated thing. And uh, I, I'm 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 muddy offhand about exactly how that works in, in allergic reactions. I, I think you're generating uh, generating this cascade. It's, it produces there are interleukins which are associated with these, which are produced when these binding events happen, and and there's some cascade that is produced there that leads to this sort of excessive immune reaction that's associated with allergy. But there are pieces of that that I'm, I don't, I'm not sure about. And, you know, one of the things that, that often happens in these things is, you know, I'm not sure about them. You go look in the books and it turns out, well, actually nobody's sure about them, um, but I'm not, I'm, I don't know if that's the case. I, I don't know if, if that's something I should know or not. All right, I think I have to wrap up in a moment here. Um, and, uh, um, there are quite a few questions here related to um, more related to our physics project and more philosophical kinds of things. 
um, which maybe I can address a different time. Um, and uh, um, gosh, uh, yeah, I don't think there's anything here that looks looks easy to answer quickly. Um, so well, thank you for all sorts of interesting questions here, um, and uh, uh, we I look forward to going on next week and trying to answer some more new questions and some more questions that I didn't get to this week. So, uh, and I, I remind people, by the way, that we now have, um, ooh, how many is it? It's at least a hundred, I would think, um, uh, recorded versions of these uh, science and technology Q and A's, and they are beautifully indexed using our, um, oh, I'm being told this is episode 99. Okay, so, so um, okay, well, next time, we get to go to triple digits, but um, uh, the um, uh, you will find these on uh, on my website, um, and uh, they've been run through Wolfram well, Language, and uh, um, nicely uh, the transcripts from these have been ground up into words, and there are word clouds which give you some indication of what was actually being talked about, and there also are questions in um, in plain text um, that uh, are are there in those recordings. So if you're interested in something that um, I might have talked about another time, I encourage you to look at those things. They exist as podcasts and so on. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, it's well, it's it's fun to answer these things. Thanks for asking all kinds of interesting questions and uh, see you again next week. Bye for now.